Hi, everyone. Just before we get going, I want to remind you that everything we talk about and discuss should not be considered as investment advice. The purpose of what we talk about on Catherine Murray Media and Markets on YouTube, as well as Catherine Murray in conversation with on my podcast, should be viewed as informational and entertainment purposes only. Please definitely do your own research, your own homework, and definitely consult an investment professional before making any investment decisions. And also to note, some of us might hold positions in some of the stocks uh, that we discuss. All right, great to be able to uh, to see you, catch up with you, and talk with you. Um, you know, I think we've been probably speaking for about a decade or so. Uh, so thank you. I always appreciate getting your views. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be uh, reconnected, and uh, this sounds like a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, I think we should probably kind of just start with your top-down view of the world, the macro picture, right? Because I really do think that there are very different and strong views in terms of whether or not we're going to be bullish or bearish, whether we've seen peak earnings growth, peak corporate profits, etc. So where do you stand today? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. It, it, I always get nervous when people start using the term peak because it, it kind of um, disguises what they really mean. And what they really mean is the pace of, of earnings growth likely reaches a peak in 2021, obviously, because it was, it was so bad in 2020, right? So coming into this earnings uh, season, we thought that we'd see something in 2021, we'd see something like 30% earnings growth, thereabouts. And right now that we're running at an 80% earnings growth. So we, we missed it again. As analysts, we, we were too conservative and we didn't know how fast the recovery was going to be. And I think that's important. So does that mean we're going to see decelerating earnings growth next year? Yeah, of course we are. But we're still going to see growth, right? And, and that's the important thing. And when you say peak, that means, oh, wait a minute, we're, we're going to the other side and, and there's something negative about that. I really don't think there is. I would tell you the three things I think that are most important. Earnings estimates for the second half of this year have gone higher. That typically doesn't happen. After earnings season, you tend to get a guide down. So estimates tend to, to start to fade or pull in for the back half of the year. They've actually gone up. So I had to raise my target price for the S&P 500 because of that. And I will likely have to do it again after this week. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's because I started the year out with a consensus thinking, the consensus estimate for earnings for the S&P 500 was going to be at or about $184. That's now sitting at 196, and I think it reaches 202 before the end of this week. So just to use the same multiple that we started the year with has moved us from 4,400 to 4,500 and likely 4,600 as a target for the S&P. Mm -hmm. Our earnings estimate for 2021 is actually going higher. Some of the things that are driving that are that there, there's actually been, because of logistical bottlenecks, there's been an expansion or an elongation of this economic recovery. And what do I mean by that? All of the things we'd love to do, we just can't do just yet. We can't buy new cars because there's not enough semiconductors. We can't fly because there's not enough seats. We can't get to the hotels we want to because there's just not enough travel and leisure workers out there. That supply response will meet that demand response, but it probably brings the recovery out well into 22 and, and, and possibly into 23. So I actually think of the, the opposite of peak is we've elongated this recovery. And I would, I would argue that this Delta variant is actually stretching that out as well. So I think we're actually at a point now where we say, yeah, 2021 was great, great economic data, certainly improving on a sequential basis, certainly great earnings, but I think we're, that we're just at the beginning of this recovery that, that likely lasts for two or three years, not just the roaring 20s of this year. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think that's um, a really interesting point that I've been thinking a lot about lately is the fact that we've got this back and forth um, news on variants and, you know, a certain percentage of the population that doesn't want to get vaccinated leads me to believe that this business cycle, the economic cycle will be even longer because you're going to have the continuation of support from various central bankers and people getting back to normalcy, but at a slower pace. So it almost just, it creates this longer time frame that we could be in this upward trajectory. Yeah, such a great point. And just, you know, case in point, uh, Two weeks ago, there was probably 25 S&P 500 companies that said, you know what, everybody's going to be back in the office um, in September. 
And half of those have already said, you know what, we're pushing that out a month. We're gonna we're gonna make that October. So it's just it's it's that type of sort of stretching out of the return to normal um, that is likely gonna stretch out the the economic recovery. Now, there's other things that need to happen too, right? So our our logistics, our bottlenecks, our supply chains need to heal, right? So we've got a lot of things that we're missing and it's not just services like we talked about in travel and leisure, but it's actually manufactured goods. And, and that's a natural offshoot of shutting the economy down and then not knowing what the pace of reopening was going to be. All of those things, we're going to start to see a supply response. And I think we're going to start to see more semiconductors manufactured. I certainly think we're going to, that will have a knock on effect to give us more telephones and more iPads and more cars and all the types of things that we'd love to have right now, but just can't get because we're on a waiting list for them. So I think that there's a, a natural recovery process. We just underestimated how long it is. And, and what's also important to that point is North America is probably doing a bit better than the rest of the world in reopening. And this is a global economy. So whatever we assumed was going to be the global economic recovery pace, that's, that's likely slower too, which means we're going to pull some of that demand into 22 as, as the rest of the world heals and gets back to some level of pre-pandemic activity. Mm -hmm. um, just to pick up on the semiconductors for a second, um, you know, we've seen some of those companies have huge runs in their stock prices, and it does obviously take years to, to build new facilities, ramp up capacity, but that is always an issue with respect to semiconductors. I mean, we can't forget that they are cyclical, at least my experience, even though there are these, you know, huge tailwinds, demand tailwinds for them as well. Um, what do you think of that sector right now, given what I said, but also the potential that, you uh, you know, maybe we see more made in America on the semiconductor front. And, and how does that tie into the timing of continuing to own that sector and feeling confident despite the valuation levels? Yeah, it's interesting. So the semiconductor index has been down for four days in a row um, coming into today. And it's the first time we've seen that going all the way back to May. And I think what's happening here is, is a couple of things. So the, the points that you bring up that I think are really important to understand is one of the things the pandemic brought to the front of mind was that our supply chains need to be a little more organized and it can't be so dependent on any one geography. Semiconductor is probably the largest dependence on one geography and that's the Asia Pacific. So to onshore manufacturing of semiconductors takes a couple of years and, and there's been multiple companies that are putting up billions of dollars across the United States, mostly in Texas, but that's gonna be a supply response that doesn't happen for a couple of years. So to your point about this, overbuilding in the cycle, we're probably not going to be, get a chance to see that because by the time that manufacturing comes up and we've got better logistics and, 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 and dual sourcing and, and better places geographic, geographically to get semiconductors from, the demand is going to continue to rise. Like we're using so many more today than we did even five years ago. I, I had no idea how many semiconductor chips are in an automobile until we, you know, the auto companies told us that they can't make enough cars because of yeah. that. And I think when we think about everything else in our lives, the internet of things and how much more that's going to be driven. But what happens in the near term, and when you talk about valuations for the semiconductors in general, I don't disagree with you that they've had a run, as has all of technology. I think that when we think about some of the FANG names, they certainly have been supportive of the S&P 500 to this point. They make up about, that's a market cap weighted index, they make up about 22% of it. What happens and what seems to be happening right now is they're really in favor as a trade when the yield on the 10 year is below its average, right? So the average yield on the 10 year is about 145. It got down to 112 last Wednesday, which yeah. was an overshoot to the downside on the heels of a bad ADP report. It's normalizing back above 130 now. And you, you notice that the, the knee jerk reaction is to sell the tech and to buy the economically sensitive cyclicals. So that's the kind of rotation or those types of rotations that I think we're going to go through through the balance of this year and into next. I think I don't think that a 2% or 2.5% yield on the 10 year is that detrimental to most technology companies, especially after we heard the earnings they reported. But psychologically in this market where it's either or right now, when the yield on the 10 year starts working its way back up to what the three month average is, technology, technology seems to be a, a source of cash. Why do you think that the earnings reaction to strong tech earnings was so muted? Such a great question. The same thing was true with the financials. So the first week of earnings season was the large money center banks, the investment banks, et cetera. Fabulous earnings, really incredible earnings. 
um, but stocks came in at all time highs, at or near all time highs, right? So that that sell the news reaction happened the first week, and then the second week things seemed to be broader in terms of reporters. A lot of a lot more sectors were reporting, but then the third week rolled around. It was all tech, and we were focusing on Facebook and Amazon and Microsoft and Apple, and all of those names were trading at or near all time highs. And the reaction function there was very much like the financials, where people just said, you know what. I've had a great run here. I've been looking for an excuse to take profits. I'm going to sell the news. Most of those sell-offs that we saw have clawed back almost all of that initial reaction. And, and yeah. the, the only one where that that's not the case is likely Amazon. And they were one of the few misses. You know, we've had 87% of companies beat their earnings estimates. Amazon just didn't happen to be one of them. Right. And um when you, I wanted to ask about Amazon, but we'll get to that in a second. But um, you know, when you think about the market right now, and I think everybody's style, it just, it really does depend on your style. But you know, you can take profits. But the amazing thing is, these stocks continue to climb back. And you know, I, my question is, you know, for people who aren't traders, what do you think in terms of understanding whether or not they should be taking profits, but then recognizing, of course, those stocks just keep climbing back? I mean, I, I don't really know the right strategy. Yeah, that's such a great question. And I think the best way to think about this is it's never going to be either or forever, right? We're never going to have it's, it's just growth or it's just cyclical. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to the beginning, so the March lows of last year, we had six months of terrific sponsorship of technology. It was all about growth, all those things that helped us through the pandemic and work from home. And then at Labor Day of last year, things got expensive in technology land. RSIs were in the 90s, very overbought. And we started getting better news on vaccines. And, and we had a real quick downdraft in the market in general, but a much larger downdraft in technology. And then a six-month rotation in economically sensitive cyclicals. So that was basically 12 months from the March lows coming into the first quarter. And since then, we've had four rotations in and out of tech and cyclical, right? And right now it feels like we're in the, at the beginnings of a out of tech and into cyclical rotation. How does the average investor navigate that process? To me, I think the best way to do that is to have a barbell approach. So you wanna have exposure to growth on one side and you wanna think thematically, things like internet of things, cloud computing, cloud security, 5G, all the technology themes that have a long runway. And you really want to express those opinions in companies that actually are measured by a price to earnings ratio and not a price to sales ratio. So you, it's, a, it's a much shorter duration trade. You're not tied to that net present value multiple um, where some of these revenue growers that just haven't uh, gotten to the point of making earnings yet. On the other side of that, you want to have cyclical exposure because I think we're going to have a long drawn out economic cycle here. So you want to think about things like financials, energy, materials, and industrials. And then you don't want to just set that and forget it. What you want to do is rebalance that every two months. And what does that mean? It means every two months, you're selling some of your winners and buying some of your losers. Unless, you're, unless your ratio is still intact after two months, you're going to take some profits and you're going to put it in the other performers. And then vice versa, you know, the next two months. Now, had you done that for all of 20, you outperformed the S&P 500 by 475 basis points. And it's working again this year. So it's impossible to time the market, but it's possible to put discipline in your diversified portfolio, have a barbell approach. Both things are going to work at some point in time. And as long as you're rebalancing every two months, you're likely going to outperform the market. And to choose two to three months in terms of rebalancing, is that a different time frame, Art, than you've used or suggested in the past? Yeah, it is. It's a little bit tighter, but I think that it's 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 sort of standard practice when you think about rebalancing your diversified portfolio. A lot of a lot of my counterparts will say you want to do that quarterly, and I'm not sure why. It feels like it's it, it depends on how you express the opinion. If you're in ETFs or if you're in single stocks, the the cost of that rebalance really is de minimis, right? It's it's but it's keeping you in check. But if you waited to the end of the first quarter last year, you were very out of, out of balance. And it certainly by the time Labor Day rolled around, you would have been much better place to catch that rotation as the cyclical. So I think two months is a, is a great target. I think it keeps you flexible and disciplined enough. So you, you get to make those hard decisions. Should I sell some of these names that have done so well right now? And you're not removing yourself from the, the exposure. You're just taking your exposure down. So it's equal weight to your exposure to cyclicals. Uh, so we've talked about this barbell approach um, and some of the growth themes like 5G, security software, cloud, et cetera, and then the, oh, and the cyclicals as well. What about from uh, a company-specific stock perspective? What, what themes or companies would be of interest? 
Well, that's interesting. So when you think it's, those are broad enough topics, when you think about cloud computing, right? When you think about 5G, 5G, for example, which we're, we're still in very early innings, we're probably further along in North America than we are outside of the, uh, the United States. But the, the, the simple way to think about this is you either get the folks that are going to sell the service. So you, you know, pick the three incumbents, whether it's AT&T, Verizon, or T-Mobile, or you think about the folks that are vendors into them. So it's um, the American towers of the world, the uh, uh, crown castles of the world, the folks that are actually doing the heavy lifting for them on the in infrastructure of this build up. Or you look at the semiconductors that are very important into that process, right? So, you know, playing semiconductors. So, so that's one of the thematics. You can think of almost the same way. And what's, what's oftentimes true is something is not always just a pure 5G play. It may have a lot to do with edge computing, cloud computing, and then the cloud security names, you know, sort of everyone knows that handful of winners right now, and they continue to do very well. On the other side of the, of the barbell, when you look at the exposure to industrials, exposure to materials, exposure to energy and financials, that's really easily accomplished either through an ETF or single stocks. We tend to favor the ETF approach because you're not having to pick winners and losers and all of that, but it's, it's certainly... Uh, an approach that dynamically helps you rebalance without writing very many tickets. Got it. Um, I noticed in your note, you, you talked about Sanderson Farms and the, the takeover of that company. Um, just kind of curious as to why you highlighted that and or your views on merger and acquisition activity, what it's looking like right now, because there's certainly been a ton of IPOs on a weekly basis. I mean, what does all of that tell you or what do you think about when you see it? Yeah, so we had a record number of stacks last year, right? And a SPAC is just a blank check company. A blank check company, by the nature of it, has to go through a merger. So we're going to see more mergers over the next two years than we've ever seen in the history of the marketplace. It's just a function of the number of newly minted SPACs that are out there looking for deals. We had more in the first quarter of this year than we had all of last year, and last year was a record. That's driving part of that M&A activity. The other piece of it is cash on balance sheets is very strong. We have... We have everyone is taking advantage where they can of low interest rates, levered up, cleaned out their balance sheet and sits on a pile of cash. That sitting on a pile of cash is very much like the personal savings rate. It's a pandemic. We don't know what to do. So we're going to hunker down and make sure we have a, you know, a, a war chest of cash. That tends to express itself when you feel better as things are getting more normal. It, it tends to express itself in three ways, right? And they're all shareholder accretive, but it's just issuing dividends, having a buyback or finding a, an accretive acquisition. I think there's going to be a record year in M&A activity this year. And I think it's across the board, right? So it, 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 there, has, there hasn't been a day that's gone by for the entire month of August where there hasn't been an interesting acquisition. And that's just going to continue. Half of those have been SPACs finally deciding what it is that they're going to be when they grow up and making that acquisition, which is a merger or a DSPAC or companies saying, hey, Here's somebody that's going to be very accretive to my business. And, and I think this is going to be something I need to bolt on here or, you know, bring in. And uh, in, in both cases, I think that's a positive sign because you don't see this kind of M&A activity if people think we're at the peak of anything. Well, that, that's what I was just going to say, though, Art, because the bear would say that tells you we're at the peak, like well, in the dot-com boom. Right, right. Well, that, in the dot-com boom, we weren't seeing acquisitions. We were just seeing anybody that could put dot-com at the end of their corporate title come public at a crazy valuation and you know measure their success by the number of clicks they had or the number of eyeballs they had. I yeah. think we're in a much different place right now. And, and these are actual companies with actual earnings. What does happen in mature industries, though, you can either try to find a disruptor or become the disruptor, right? And so you, if you're a, a financial company and JB, uh, uh, JP Morgan, uh, Jamie Dimon had you know, a, some great things to say about some of the disruptors in his earnings call, which I thought was very interesting. It's like, we blew it. We didn't do what Square is doing or we didn't do what, you know, but in that message, he's telling you, oh, by the way, we're going to buy one of these guys because mm. we, didn't, we didn't build it. So right now, we're, I think we're more at the cycle of, there's disruptors out there nipping at our heels. We either build it ourselves or we go out and buy these guys because we need that growth in our in our business. I still don't think that that's a signal that there's something wrong with the market. I think that's a signal that new technologies and new ways of doing things are actually becoming more mainstream and larger incumbent companies are either trying to figure out how to build it themselves or how to buy it. 
And are, what, um, what worries you the most though right now? I mean, I know we always kind of talk about COVID and maybe it's COVID, maybe it's deficits, inflation, mm-hmm. or is it something else? What, what um, cause you sound very positive. And yeah, so I'm really good. I, I'm, I think that the three things that, that I get, that keep me awake at night is how much we've overestimated our ability to see a supply response to the, to the amazing aggregate demand we have for almost everything, right? And, and how frustrated we might get with that process. So what does that mean? You know, does, if I can't get the iPhone 12 in time for Christmas, does that mean I'm never going to get it? Or does that mean I'm actually going to get it in January when I can finally get it? It feels like it's more of that, but I just don't know that there's going to be a frustration where just like, you know what, I can't do those things that I've been, you know, dying to do for the last 16 months where I've been held up in my in my cottage. I think the second thing I get concerned about is underestimating the uneven recovery that we're seeing globally, right? We touched upon that a little bit, but North America is doing much better in terms of getting reopened. The rest of the world is struggling. Asia is going through some major issues with this new variant now. India is in bad shape, parts of the UK, certainly parts of Europe. So if we have estimates for global economic growth that, that are kind of tied to the kind of pace of recovery we're seeing, Mm-hmm. I think we may well be ahead of ourselves in that, and we and we need to sit back and say, "Hey, we're over. We're underestimating how much further ahead we are in recovery than the rest of the globe." I think away from that, I think that the, the normal concerns of of things like do we see major changes in fiscal or monetary policy? I don't think we're going to, but you know, we're going to see some changes in monetary policy. We're going to see that soon. Do we get an overreaction to that, or has this been one of the most telegraphed changes in? monetary policy in the history of uh, <laughs> that that's true because it has been telegraphed and and there are people concerned that they're going to taper um mm-hmm. maybe september i think was something that was just mentioned to me today december maybe i mean right. is the market prepared this time or is it you know december of 2018 all over again yeah you know what the the, the real taper tantrum happened in 2013 and it happened because uh Chairman Bernanke was up on Capitol Hill and actually fielded a question. And, and as opposed to talking about this in a presser, which they didn't have after all their meetings and they do now, mm. he actually talked about it in, a, in, a, in front of the Senate Banking Committee, answered a question, said, yeah, we'll probably start uh, tapering our purchases you know, sometime in the next couple of months. And the market just got caught by surprise. Would you be surprised at all if at the September meeting or even at Jackson Hole, the Kansas City Fed meeting that... that uh, Jay Powell were to talk about tapering a little bit and actually announce in September that, hey, here's the shape and cadence of what it's going to look like and then start in December. And oh, by the way, started in a cadence that's likely to be 10 billion a month in equal portions to both the mortgage backs and the treasuries and take a year to accomplish that. Would you be surprised if if that process and, and leaving the balance sheet the same size meant that the Fed was still in the open market buying 40 to $60 billion in assets for the matured assets that are rolling off? All of that is... Well telegraphed, I think, I hope, because it's it, it's certainly something that's been talked about ad nauseum for a while. I don't know that that's going to tip the apple cart over necessarily. I think you're still going to have a very accommodative Fed, unless and until we get to full employment. And then they'll start thinking about raising the actual Fed funds rate, interest rates going higher. That likely doesn't happen until the end of 22 or the beginning of 23 at the earliest. So I think in front of us, we can see an account- accommodative Fed. I think where things get a little tripped up is if we can't um, kind of reconcile how we're paying for some of the aggressive infrastructure plans and, 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 and you know, where, what does that mean towards fiscal policy? But when you look at the makeup of the Democratic majority right now, there are just so many sort of down the center, fiscally conservative Democrats that it's going to be impossible to make a really big change to tax code, I think, this year. So. You know, there's a possibility, but I just don't think you have support for any drastic changes. And that brings us to the 22 and you've got a whole other election cycle in the midterm. So I don't know yeah. that that's going to be the problem. I don't think it's good. I, with Jay Powell running the Fed, I don't think it's going to be a communications issue. I think he wants to over communicate and make sure the market's aware of how they're thinking and and how that's changed. You know, the, the last time we really had tantrums about things that the Fed was doing, it really happened at a point where. We didn't have press conferences all the time. We have one after every meeting, and then you have a parade of Fed speakers that don't have an unshared thought. So I think that there's good. Well, if we're surprised yeah. by the Fed, it's going to be. A, 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 I'd be surprised if we're surprised. It. 
I hope you're right. It's the Fed speak, though, that always kind of gets people's ears perked up, right? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, too. And it doesn't take much combination of things to have people think in the other direction, too. So just last Wednesday, the ADP report was a clunker, right? And, and we're very disappointed. And lo and behold, the, the jobless claims number on Thursday of last week came out, and they were much better than expected. We're you know, under 400,000 for two or three weeks in a row. The continuing claims was under 3 million for the first time post-pandemic. And then lo and behold, Friday came out and the moving average of jobs created on a non-farm payroll basis went from 539 to 842 with the revisions. So we went from thinking the labor market's not that great to wow, we're in a different place. And immediately investors start talking about, oh, there's gonna be a September taper and the Fed's gonna do this. So I think we overreact to the incoming data. I think the Fed underreacts to the incoming data. They would like to make significant progress before they make changes. They've started to, they get, they're gonna need two more good uh -huh. uh, job, jobs reports. And then I think they'll start talking about the timing. You know, I just want to pick up on, on one wording that you kind of used, which was um, overreaction. I, I wonder, you know, because you've been in the business a long time. I started a long time ago in the business. And certainly in those days when I worked at William Blair in like 1997 and in equity research, and to your point, yeah, anytime there was a dot-com ad, like borders.com, lensend.com, stock popped, right? And you just right. had to be so aware of that. But, but the point being is that we didn't pay as much attention really to the U.S. Federal Reserve in those days for perhaps obvious reasons or, or, or fine reasons. Um, but my question is, you know, because people listening and sitting at home and, and seeing stocks move and, and all the reactions and maybe overreactions, it's kind of sometimes hard to get your head around in terms of how you want to proceed with your, with your portfolio. So my question to you is, is it different now than it used to be in terms of reactions? And is that in part because of the co composition of the market with the high frequency traders, dark pools, et cetera. Like, is it different or were we just maybe not as attuned to what it is today because of all the media outlets, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, we have so much more information today than when you started in the business and, and you know, back in the stone ages when I started in the business, the exact same thing. Paul Volcker was the chairman of the Fed. There was no press conference. There was no announcements. You'd find out by looking at the you know Chase Manhattan Bank and what they raised their prime rate to, and you could just mirror that to what the Fed would do. They, they would meet, they would raise rates in between meetings to you know whip inflation. Now um, we're in a much more transparent world with information at our fingertips. That yeah, there's the ability to overreact to things. When did that happen? So I would tell you it happened in March when the yield on the ten year went to one and three quarters. Huge overreaction, and all we could talk about was inflation. And then we started getting used to the fact that, hey, wait a minute, lumber prices are rolling over, energy prices have come down, the industrial metals are coming back in. And then we had an overshoot to the downside when the yield was 112 last Wednesday, thinking that the jobs recovery was over and we're not going to create any more jobs in this country. So I think that the access to information is what's changed things. And to your point, the number of people that can react to that quickly, right? Mm -hmm. So. When you think about the people that are actually act, active market participants, both in fixed income and in equities, that can react at, at hyper speed to any changes of information, you're going to see those much more volatility. And I think that that's that's what's different than you know in the in the 80s and 90s when we were cutting our teeth in this business. And I think that's probably it's not good or bad. It's just what it is, right? It's 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 the new normal. How do you as an investor think about this? You need to tune out some of the noise. Mm -hmm. and think about your game plan. So if you've set up a diversified portfolio and your equity allocation is in companies that you truly believe have long runways and, 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 and can grow revenues and earnings, you don't want to react to things like the Fed making an announcement on tapering. That's, that's not part of your long-term invest, investment thesis. You're not mm -hmm. buying tech companies or, or cyclical companies because you think the Fed somehow is going to push us into a recession, right? And or, or, you know, going to cause... They're going to make a mistake and push us to recession. You're you're investing for the long haul, and as long as you keep an eye on your diversification and not overreact to the noise, I think you're going to be in a much better place. Okay, um, I'm glad I got your thoughts on that because I think that there is so so much volatility, noise that goes on, and um, you know, good good to have perspective in terms of what the rate plan, game plan, or strategy is. So our, we will leave it there. And on that note, I thank you very very much for for doing this with me today. Always a pleasure. It's great to see you. Thank you. You too. I know. I can't wait till it's in person and it will be.